people under my care. But, but regardless of how justified it is, I've still taken a life. And I need to repent of that. Even if it was justified, I need to repent of that. I, I, I honestly, I mean, I really question um, Christians are Christians are kind of gung ho. Conservative Christians are gung ho with you know having a gun for home defense in your house and are kind of proud of that a lot of times. And it's like, well, okay, but understand understand the spiritual ramifications, and you really just can't be callous toward taking people's lives. And you should do everything possible to preserve life. Everything possible it is to preserve life. <laughs> Right? I'm not going to swing, if somebody is attacking my wife, the first place I'm going to swing the baseball bat is not probably at their head. I mean, now, in panic and rage, it, I may lose sense of what I'm doing, and I might do that. But, but I'm, not going to, I'm not going to try to kill the person who's attacking. It's just not. I mean, I would, hope, I would hope that God would stay my hand so that I don't kill the person that, I, that is attacking. Because that's still breaking the fifth commandment. All right, that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, I think I think you should take uh, great care if if that ever ever comes on. It's not to shoot first and ask questions later. That's not regardless of what the movies say and show. That's not that's not the that's not our first response. It's not shoot first, kill the person, and then find out what's going on. All right. So if you have a gun ever in your home for self-defense, well, do everything possible not actually to pull the trigger. Everything possible not to pull the trigger. Joel? Okay, so, what if it's like you... Okay, this is a little weird. But like, what if you like, Don't give me what ifs. Okay, is this a ridiculous okay. what if? Not kind is of. Is it not ridiculous? Really, like, I wouldn't... It's kind of... Hard. All right, go ahead, ask. So if you ran over a cat and you felt guilty, is that like... You not to make a sin, but devil wants you to think you made a sin. What? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know. Like, what is that? I don't think there is any sin involved in running over a cat. So why do you feel oh, guilty? A dog, maybe, but not a cat. Oh, no, I'm kidding. You are so mean. I know, I know. You we, are so we have a whole bunch of cat lovers in here, so it's fun. Yeah, it's just, it's I like messing with you guys. <laughs> I have cats, dogs, <laughs> fish, poisons. All right, so, so, uh, I love you. Uh, 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 I mean, I think, uh, I think if you accidentally do something like that, I mean, I mean, you might still be, I, I could see, I could see the case where you're still, uh, uh, if it, if the cat's owned by somebody, right, you're, you're sort of breaking the, Seventh commandment by taking their property away. You're kind of uh, breaking the fifth commandment by making them feel sad and and uh, all of that over over the death of their precious kitten. Uh, kittens are kittens are pretty precious. If they could stay kittens forever, I could be a cat person. Um, I don't know. I, that's an interesting. It's an interesting question. I mean, if you do it maliciously, if you see a cat or you see a squirrel, I mean, I know people who like who like uh, uh, go after animals that cross the road, right? I, uh, I mean, I don't know that we should go after God's creation like that necessarily, but, but then I mean, sometimes animals are nuisances, and so uh, that's a tough, that's a really tough one, Joel. I think it kind of depends on your motivation and what you're doing and why you're doing it, and and you should be careful of all those things. I wouldn't say that killing an animal. Uh, accidentally or on purpose is necessarily sinful, but I think maybe your motivation um, could become sinful, right? So, so if you just go out, if you just go out and you, uh, your dad finds an antelope herd out in Wyoming, and and he's with you know several other guys, and they just take their rifles and unload and shoot as many antelope as they can and leave the meat to rot. Well, well, you're you're breaking all kinds of Wyoming state laws, right? I mean. You're you're very much sinning. If, if you accidentally run over a squirrel, I I'm not sure that you're sinning because there's a lot of squirrels. I don't I don't know. That's an interesting question. Hmm. Um. So I don't I don't know about the, it's about the shooter thing and after he 
I yeah. saw on the news, and I, I don't know why he got, uh, um, my he got guess, arrested. I, I don't no, he didn't get arrested yet, did he? I don't Nobody, know. he didn't get arrested yet. Um, it was, that was an accident. Excuse me. My, my guess is, uh, yeah, they shouldn't have had live ammunition. I, I don't know what they're going to do with that me. case. I, I think he very much violated the Fifth Commandment because he took a life, and even if it was accidental, he took a life, yeah. right? And, and he needs to, he, I, I don't have any idea if he's a Christian or not, quite yeah. honestly. I, I don't know if he's, I, I don't know if he's a Christian or not, but he, but he needs to repent of that, right? And, and say, I'm sorry for that. Yes. Is it true that a man, that a person can kill a, a person and ask for forgiveness, and they go to heaven, but someone who steals every day and never asks for forgiveness can go to hell? Awesome. Sure. Absolutely. Wait, wait. Right? Because because uh, heaven and hell depends on the gift of faith and and um, uh Faith inspires in us to be sorry for our sins, right? And, and if you're not sorry for your sins, then uh, you kind of have to question if you really have faith, right? So, so salvation is by God's grace through faith in Christ alone, right? That's how you're saved. And um, uh, so it is uh, very possible for... Uh, Adolf Hitler to be in heaven if he repented at the end of his life. All right? And it's very possible for the sweet little old lady next door who isn't a Christian and didn't care about Jesus at all, but was just the nicest person, gave you like buckets of candy at Halloween and, and uh, mowed your lawn and I mean did all kinds of things, baked you pies and all kinds of stuff and served in the community, right? Um, if she didn't have faith, She'd be in hell. Right? And, and then people say, well, that's not fair. And it's like, well, well, yes, it is. Because we're saved by grace through faith in Christ alone. Joel, I'm not going to answer you again. Leo? What about suicide? Oh, yeah. Uh, man, that fifth was my commandment question. last year. Open up your, your, your confirmation book and look at this. God gives life. God yeah. takes life. End of story. Period. Is suicide simple? Yes. Does it mean that you're automatically in hell? No. I would say no. It doesn't mean that you're automatically in hell. Well, you can't. Um, the the Christian church for a long, long, long time taught that you were automatically in hell. Looking at the story of Judas, for example, taught that you were in hell automatically. Martin Luther. Martin Luther kind of did some groundbreaking. Um, writing on the subject and, and said that uh, uh, you can't know uh, the person's heart. And, and we would say today, how I would say today, knowing uh, um, uh, psychology, right, the study of psychology today has brought us um, uh, really far, I think, in answering that question. Um, and what I would say, and what a lot of theologians would say, is that um, uh, a mess up in the mind doesn't necessarily change your heart. So just because somebody is suffering from depression or or uh, whatever it might be that they're suffering from doesn't mean that a, a head malady doesn't necessarily change the heart. So so we would not say that a suicide a, a victim of suicide is is automatically in hell. It's very possible. It's very possible that in a state of depression they have forsaken Jesus and said you know no I. I Jesus can't help me, won't help me, and I don't believe in him. I mean, that's a possibility for a Christian who commits suicide that, that may have lost the faith beforehand. But, but typically, if a Christian commits suicide and I have to do that funeral, I'm going to point to their baptism and point to that understanding that, that um, a defect in the brain does not necessarily change the heart. All right, and, and then that gives that gives hope, right? Because then then the person's in Jesus' hands, and, and Jesus knows whether they were in the faith or not. Walter, I do want to get done with this lesson, guys. So this is this is great though. This is just like my lifelike class today. I did lifelike today, and I would have been done. It's a two-hour class. I would have been done in probably eighty or ninety minutes. And they kept asking all of these random questions that took us down 
all kinds of trails, and it and it ended up being like two hours and ten minutes long. So I, I can stay. I, I don't have anything this evening. So you know, uh, eight 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 thirty is fine with me. So Walter. What is she like? And still he wants to ask the question. With that threat, he still wants to ask the question. That's fascinating. Go ahead. You just know that I'm not going to keep you here till 8 o'clock, don't you? Yeah. 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 Okay. Wait, start over? What is she working on? I still wasn't paying attention. At the bottom, of it, there's a sign that says, do not enter. Someone enters and you throw a rock down because you don't know that they're down there. Oh, yeah. See, accidental accidental killing is still breaking the Fifth Commandment, right? I mean, right, any, whatever the accidental death is, right, you're still, you're still taking life that God doesn't want you to take. Now, does that mean that it's not forgivable? Well, of course not. Of course it's forgivable. But, but might you struggle with guilt and Satan's accusations? Absolutely. So tell Satan to screw. I mean, um, you buzz <laughs> off and uh, tell Satan. To, <laughs> whoops. I was going to say, I was gonna say screw off, but um, that's pretty common parlance, maybe. But um, tell Satan to buzz off and go back to hell and leave leave me alone because my sin is forgiven, even if it was an accidental murder. But, but quite honestly, you might struggle with that for a long, long time. I mean, Vicar's actually going to tell a story in his sermon on Sunday where his uh, great-grandfather great, great grandfather was in World War II and, and struggled to dying, dying day about taking life in World War II. Um, so, uh, yeah, Vicar was actually going to share that in his sermon Sunday. So, uh, I mean, yeah, you might struggle with it, but, but you have to just uh, over and over and over again be reminded that your, your sin is forgiven. Your sin is forgiven, and you don't stand accused before God, so why would you accuse yourself? Or jump out 80 stories up or whatever it was. Yeah, yeah don't die. Uh, I knew they were going to probably die either way. I know, I know. That desperation... Uh, uh, same, same dealio, right? I mean, it, it's still taking life that isn't yours to take, right? Uh, again, does that automatically mean that you're in hell? Well, no, I really don't think so because um, in, in that circumstance, I doubt that anybody was thinking with all the noodles in their head, right? I mean, just think that that was, uh, can't even imagine, right? Cora, I saw that. I was, uh, I was teaching confirmation class when that happened, when the first plane hit the tower. I was teaching confirmation class, and I walked into... Wait, confirmation? Uh, I walked into... Uh, it was at a Lutheran school, so it was during the morning. And I walked into my senior pastor's office, and we just sat and watched his TV in awe. Awe. Watched the second plane hit the tower live. Crazy. All right. Cora, this is my last one, and then we're moving on. Aww. So put down your hands. So you know those government officials that like to take criminals' lives because, like, they did... Yeah, so God, Romans 13 tells us <coughs> God gives the sword to the government to control evil in the world. God gives the sword to the government to be God's hand of justice to control evildoers. Now, do they always do that rightly? No. Probably not. Um, should Christians automatically be against the death penalty? Yes. No. You can argue. You can argue if the death penalty is the best way to curb evil behavior, but a Christian cannot argue whether the death penalty is right or wrong. The death penalty is right. Romans thirteen gives the state, the government, authority to um, kill evildoers, right? So, so the argument for, we talked about this last year too, in Fifth Commandment, uh, uh, God gives the state the right to execute evildoers. So for the Christian, the argument isn't, is the death penalty right or wrong? The death penalty is right. Given by God in Romans 13. You may argue whether the death penalty is the best way to curb evil behavior in society. 
That's the argument for the Christian. Is it the best way? But but it's not a, it's not a question of whether it's right or wrong. And and you might say you might say it's not the best way because innocent people get killed. Innocent people get executed. And you might you might say that uh, that uh, violent crimes don't actually go down as as uh, uh, violent crimes don't go down as um, uh, executions go up, right? I mean, you could look at all of the studies and everything and, and give a reasonable reasonable argument for or against the death penalty uh, in terms of its merits, but not, not in terms of um, right or wrongness. Because as a Christian, we, we would view that the government has um, God's permission to take life of evildoers. Again, I mean, the government has to do that in a in a right and good way, right? The Revolutionary War was arguably not a uh, godly war, and uh, the government or the new government of the United States was wrong, probably waging the Revolutionary War. We should all be uh, Britons today. Um, that's that's good. And and uh, and so uh, so you can't. Uh, can't always say that the government's right in what they do, right? The Hitler was obviously wrong in the mass executions because he thought um, Jews were somehow defective, right? So, so there is wrongness in how governments use um, Romans 13 as well. So that all has to be weighed in in a reasonable and godly discussion. Leo? It's about the death penalty, what if your argument was they have more to repent. Absolutely, that's a great. I, I think that's a great. That's a great argument. Lock them up, lock them up forever, so that um, they may well have more time to repent. I, I don't. I don't see anything wrong with that. That's a great argument for a Christian to make um, against the death penalty. Absolutely, right. So that was it. Remember, that was it. That was it. Uh, all right. And then death, you cannot have my gladness, I'm baptized into Christ. And then, and then there's nothing worth comparing to this lifelong comforture. Open-eyed, my grave is staring, even though they're all sleep secure. Though my flesh awaits its raising, still my soul continues praising, because I'm in heaven, my soul is in heaven, uh, waiting for that resurrection. I'm a baptized, I'm baptized into Christ, I'm a child of paradise. All right, so the next uh, place in, his, in this... Uh, 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 exaltation is rose, right? He rose, and the real the real emphasis there is that he rose. How? How did he rise? How did he rise? What? What rose? What rose? Body. His body rose. He rose physically from the dead. It wasn't just spiritual resurrection where his body is still in the tomb somewhere, right? There is a there is a cool book. Uh, uh, Concordia Publishing House published it. It's, uh, uh, it was by Paul Meyer, who's one of our uh, Lutheran Church Missouri Synod historians. He's just a fantastic guy. I've done a bunch of his Bible studies uh, here at uh, Beautiful Savior. And uh, Paul Meyer, he wrote a, uh, a book called A Skeleton in God's Closet. And, and the whole idea of the book is that an archaeologist finds Jesus' body. Mm. It, it's a really, it's a really cool book. It's a really cool book. It's a, if you like kind of a, a mystery thriller, archaeology uh, kind of a book, a skeleton in God's closet. Um, uh, because because if you actually found Jesus' body, right, what happens with Christianity? It 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 means nothing, right? Uh, Christianity would mean nothing because Paul said, if Christ had not raised from the dead, your faith is in vain. Christ is not raised from the dead, your faith is in vain. So it's kind of a cool thing. But, uh, but so it's really important for Christianity to say that Jesus rose physically. There's no body in the tomb. No body in the tomb. <coughs> Jesus' body rose from the dead. So, so this is a, a bodily resurrection. What, Cooper? Is it fiction? Not real? The, the other book, yes. That book is totally Goodness. fiction, obviously. That's good. Obviously, because we believe what the Bible says. Right? Yeah. 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 All right. Letter A, what does Jesus' resurrection mean for us? Romans 6. 3 to 11, we'll probably read part of this. So open your Bible, Romans 6, 
3 to 11. Uh, Carter, Reber 3, Cooper 4, come around the room, come back here to Harrison. All right. Go. All right, wait, stop. No, I was waiting for Cooper and Izzy to be done talking. All right, are we ready? Um, all right, Romans 6 3. Carter. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Four, Cooper? Four, I, I, I'm trying. Woman. All right, you keep it. Leo? Uh, go 6 4. Uh, Find it. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm. Go 6 4. Okay. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in the newness of life. All right, so, um, was that the four? Four is a long verse, huh? Four, yeah. Read four again. Listen, here's your answer. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. So what does Jesus' resurrection mean for us? We have new life. Right, we have new life. Letter B, 1 Corinthians 15, 17. Find that for me, Walter. Walter's got 1 Corinthians 15, 17. What if Jesus had not risen from the dead? Oh, I already told you this answer. This I is can't stuff. First Corinthians 15, 17. If Jesus hadn't raised from the dead, what? No, I can't read. You can't read? What do you mean? I can't find it. You can't find it? Yeah. Bible program? Do you have it up? I can't find the book. Okay. Don't worry about it. All right. We're on, we're on letter B anyway. We read all that we needed. We only needed verses 3 and 4. Don't get frustrated, Cooper. Cooper, look at me. Don't get frustrated when you can't find things. All right? We spent a lot of time talking about the fifth commandment, right? And I want to move along. So it's okay, right? It's always okay. We don't... Nothing. This is a fun time learning God's Word. We don't get emotional about things. Even if cats get run over by cars. <laughs> we don't get emotional about anything. Puppies, deer, Bambi getting shot, right? We don't have to worry about anything, right? So we move on, and we do what Pastor Schultz says, and we don't get upset about what we, where we are and everything, okay? No. Sorry. It's all good. I'm sorry, that really bothers you. That pushes your button, doesn't it? I apologize for that, okay? I got you. I will try to restrain myself in the future. All right. I, I actually am not a cat hater. I, I like cats. I've just never... We had an outdoor cat growing up, and so I liked having kittens and cats, okay? So it's just a joke between people who are dog people and cat people. And, I'm a dog person. And that's... Just not a personal thing, okay, Ian? All right. So I apologize for that. I know some people can uh, be very sensitive to things like that, all right? So I will try to restrain myself in the future, all right? And if I don't, laugh with me, okay? Make a joke about a dog. <laughs> Someday you'll be able to. All right. I'll try to restrain myself. All right. So... 1 Corinthians 15, 17. Walter? And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Alright, so what happens if Christ didn't raise from the dead? Our faith is futile. futile. How about you say in vain? All right. Futile, futile means it's worthless, it doesn't mean anything, right? So our faith is in vain. Alright. So, what does Jesus' resurrection prove? What do you think Jesus' resurrection proves? I've got four things, right? I think you can come up with probably most of these. What does Jesus' resurrection prove? Because Jesus rose from the dead, 
what can we say for absolute certain is he? Um, he is God. Very good. Yeah, I absolutely, absolutely. That's my first one. Even is he? Right. He is God. What else can we say for certain? Because Jesus rose from the dead. Oh, there is a God. Um, I'll take that as the same as is he basically. Uh, he did what he said. Okay. I wrote this, his word is truth. Right? I, I would agree with it. Uh, that's a good answer, right? Uh, right? It's just a little bit more than he did what he said, right? Because it's everything. Everything. Because he rose, it means that everything he says is truth. Right? I mean that he said that he would rise. I realize that, but it's more than just that narrow thing. It, it means that that word is true, but everything is true. Because, because he did what he said, his word is truth. So I'm just saying it's a little bit fuller, right? I mean, it's a little bit more. All right, so Joel, down to two more answers. Say, or we might be saved. Well, it, it means that because Jesus rose, what happens to us? We don't we die. We say. We, 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 listen to the guy behind you. We say. Now he's not telling you again. That's pretty funny. We are. Is he? We will rise because Jesus rose. We rise, right? It's that. Uh, it's that. Uh, yeah. It's that. Uh, 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 I believe in the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Right? Because Jesus rose. If Jesus didn't rise, your faith is in vain, and you will stay in the grave. All right, so that's the third one. All believers in Jesus will rise. If you just said we will rise, that's fine too. We will rise. And the last one is this. Uh, it proves that Jesus' sacrifice for sin is accepted by the Father. Jesus' sacrifice for sin is accepted by the Father. Yeah, so uh, uh, a sacrifice... A sacrifice needs to be acceptable to God, right? So, so in the Old Testament, when people did sacrifices for sin, they did them as God commanded them to do them, right? It was, it was very specific. This is how you do a sacrifice for sin, so that your sins would be forgiven. And they did these very specifically. So uh, the one and once and for all sacrifice for sin, right? He dies. He dies, and if he had stayed dead then we stay dead. Sin is not paid for. Sin is not forgiven. All of that happens. But because Jesus rises from the dead, that means that His sacrifice paid for our forgiveness, life, and salvation. Does that make sense? Because Jesus rose, His sacrifice pays for our forgiveness, life, and salvation. So His sacrifice is accepted by the Father. As Alright. Cora. What was the answer for that one again? What? The one that we just said. Jesus' sacrifice is accepted by the Father. Jesus' sacrifice is accepted by the Father. Fourthly, he ascended. What does ascended? What's the what's the focus of ascended? Um, what ascended into heaven? How did he ascend into heaven? Yeah, Harrison, does this sort of know the mind of pastor? I don't know. I don't know how to ask this question to get you to say what I want you to say. Harrison, how did he rise from the dead? What did we say for that? Physically. Physically. His body rose from the dead. So how did he ascend into heaven? Physically. Bodily. His, 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 he, he ascended bodily into heaven. His 
human body, his human body is now in heaven. And his human body is wherever he wants his human body to be. So when you receive the Lord's Supper, what do you receive? His body and blood. His body and blood is present in the Lord's Supper. But he ascends bodily into heaven. And then he continues to be omnipresent because he's God. And so his human body can be wherever he wants his human body to be, uh, namely in the Lord's Supper, for example. And he goes there to do what? I go and... Uh, John 14, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Um, no one comes to the Father except through me. And uh, he says, you know the way, you know the, you know the way to the place where I'm going. And uh, one of the disciples says, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? Oh, no, wait, this is before that. Uh, shoot, I'm futzing it up now. Um, hold, hold. Oh, here we go. All right. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you that, or would I have told you that I go and... You know the rest of the verse? In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to... Prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again to take you to myself, that where I am you may be also. And Thomas said, Lord, I don't, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? And Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. All right? So uh, he ascends, ascends bodily to the Father, to prepare a place for us. That's what I would write on that line. Bodily. He ascends bodily to the Father to prepare a place for us. Ascended bodily to prepare a place for us. He ascended bodily to the Father to prepare a place for us. All right, we got that? Sits at the right hand of God. What the heck does that mean? Does that mean he has like a mini throne next to God the Father's big throne? Maybe. No. In the Old Testament, the right hand is always the Addison? Like, um, I don't know the word for it, but like it like right hand means uh like Throw a spit out something. You're probably right. It's like First, you know, I don't know. I don't know the words. It's the hand of God. victory. Victory is not bad. I was gonna say, like back then, they would where the kind of where the handshake originated from is to show that you had a you know, weapon, so it would like be a sign of a weapon. Yeah, 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 right, 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 right. What did the king wield in his right hand? The sword. The sword. Jesus, the sword. And, and the scepter to rule by. So so what is the right hand? In the Old Testament, the right hand is a euphemism. Say euphemism. Euphemism. <laughs> Say euphemism. 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 Saying, okay, you guys are funny. Uh, euphemism, a euphemism. You know what a euphemism is? No. It's like it's like a it's like a phrase that means something else. Right? It's a phrase that means something else. So so the right hand of God is a euphemism that means a position of power and glory, of might. Victory isn't a bad guess, is he, right? I mean, it's all related, right? Because it's the right hand that wields the sword and the ruling scepter, the sword of power and the ruling scepter, and uh, it's that right hand that does that, all right? So Jesus ascends to a position, not a, not a mini throne, but he, he ascends to a position of power and authority. Power and a, a position of power and authority, that's what you want to write there. 
on number six. Citizen of the reign of God, position of power and authority. Right. So it's not a physical location, it's more of the position of power and authority. Alright. Six. We'll come to judge the living and the dead. What does that mean? What does that mean for believers? Joel? Come back down and judge the living and the dead. That um, Like everyone is alive and dead. Like, is that what living and dead mean? Everybody who's alive and dead? That's like, great. The bodies are like... great. <laughs> oh, Joel, you cracked me up. Uh, so, so, Joel has uh, restated the question, so that's good. Um, he will come to judge, he will come down to judge those who are alive and dead, yeah. right? We'll, we'll come to judge the living and the dead, right? Um, so what does that mean for believers? For believers! What does that mean for believers? To call on somebody who hasn't spoken today. Give me an answer, Ian. What does it mean that he is going to come to just living in the dead for believers? Uh, good question. 